Greetings, an interview with Valerie Steele, Director and Chief Curator of the Museum at FIT, Fashion Institute of Technology. I am I.K. Ude. What is the name of your current exhibition and how did it come about? I began working on the Daphne Guinness exhibition about two years ago when I met Daphne and almost immediately asked her if she would be willing to co-curate an exhibition with me about her personal style. So we've been working on this show for a long time, uh, long before McQueen died. In planning the exhibition, what role did Miss Guinness play? The idea came to me because there have been so many exhibitions about great fashion designers, from Yves Saint Laurent to Alexander McQueen, but very few exhibitions about individual women of style. And yet these are the people who make the clothes come alive off the runway and in the real world. And in today's world, I think that Daphne Guinness is the most inspiring and individual fashion icon. How did you flesh out the framework of the exhibition? Daphne uh, is very well organized, and her clothes are all on a computer database. So the first thing that we did was she sent me a disc that I could print off which had small thumbnail pictures of all you know, 2,500 of her garments. And so I made a first selection of those together with my colleague Fred Dennis. And then Daphne came into the office and she reviewed them and said that was all fine. Um, and so then I would say, but you know, here if we have this jacket by Azadine Alaya, how did you wear it? With what um, shirt, what pants? And so then she would style it the way she would wear it today. So ultimately we have a, finally about a hundred looks in the exhibition. And I decided how I wanted to arrange them based on two years of looking at Daphne's clothes and interviewing her to get a sense of aspects of her style. Because I did not want to organize them by designer, you know, one platform McQueen, one Lagerfeld. I wanted to have it aspects of her style. So one platform is dandy, for all the men's wear influences. Another platform is dedicated to her love of armor, etc. Daphne let us borrow whatever we wanted, and she made additional suggestions of things that we should include. And she styled all of the looks that were, um, involved pieces that were put together into an ensemble. And indeed, she styled really everything because she also put on all of the costume jewelry and the ribbons and the accessories. So the only thing I had to insist on was that it be no real diamonds, no real rubies. It's all costume jewelry in the show. So, she was a co-curator. From the beginning, I wanted Daphne to be co-curator of the show because it's about her personal style and who better than she could know what that was. If you can clarify again, in what order was the exhibition arranged? The exhibition is arranged in seven categories. The first room has an iconic jumpsuit and cape by McQueen, sort of to set the stage, this is Daphne. And then the, surrounding that are about a dozen pairs of shoes and other small accessories like a gauntlet glove and a lot of imagery, a videotaped interview with Italian Vogue, one of her own films, still photographs. Then you go into the big room and there's six categories, dandy, armor, daytime chic, evening chic, sparkle, and exotic. In addition, we have two films, one that Daphne directed, another that she starred in, in the main room. And finally, we have a para-hologram that we made with Daphne, especially for the exhibition, which is hanging from the ceiling. Would you say that Daphne is a passive consumer in collaboration with designers, or she buys what she likes, or even commission dresses. Um, Daphne says, and I think she's right, that she's not a muse. She's not associated with any one designer, although she was particularly close to McQueen. But she calls herself like a bee who flies from flower to flower. So she will 
buy things from different designers. If they become friends of hers, she'll be able to buy things off the runway because she's a sample size. Sometimes she'll buy things just in stores. She never felt it was necessary to know the designer, but only to appreciate their work. And she's far from being just a consumer. Hers is really, really a collection of fashion. She collects fashion the way one would collect art or stamps from the point of view of a connoisseur who knows a lot about the most important movements in fashion. What is the oldest and latest pieces from her collection that are in the exhibition? There are approximately a hundred pieces in the exhibition. 100. Everything in the exhibition is from the last 15 years or so. So we don't have things from you know her earlier life. We decided not to put in things from pre-marriage or the years when she was married. This is really all since about 1997, since when Daphne really became Daphne Guinness as we know her. What happens to the clothes after the exhibition? After the exhibition closes, the clothes are going to go back to Daphne's closet, or closets, I should say. It would be nice if she wanted to donate something to the museum. Uh, she's already given us some pieces in the past. And I think she also was talking about doing an auction at some point to start a foundation to protect uh, and explore um, how Isabella Blow's collection can best be shared with the world. How does this exhibition compare or contrast with your usual museum program? The exhibitions that we do at FIT vary a lot. We do relatively few on individual designers. Most of our shows are thematic, so things like the corset or gothic. Sometimes it's a designer like Madame Gray or Ralph Rucci. Um, many years ago, Richard and Harold did a show here, which was about Tina Chow, who was also a great collector of haute couture and a, a woman of tremendous personal style. So I would say that this exhibition fits in very well with our program of exhibitions. What are the general and particular objectives of a fashion museum for the contemporary audience. For the museum at FIT, our mission is to advance knowledge of fashion through exhibitions, publications, and public programs. How have you gone about fulfilling these objectives and how successfully? In order to try and advance knowledge of fashion and to get fashion taken seriously as a real cultural force, we collect, conserve, document, exhibit, and interpret fashion. We focus on fashion that is artistically and historically significant, in particular fashion that's directional, that um, directs the course of fashion history, that influences other designers. Interesting phrase that you've employed here quote, directional fashion, unquote. How would you define directional fashion? I think directional fashion is fashion that sets the course of where fashion is going to be going. So it's fashion that other designers look at and are inspired by. For example? Well, it could be, for example, uh, the work of designers like Gautier when he did all of the sort of gender bending things and testing the limits of taste and class. Or it could be something like, um, well, with McQueen, for example, the sort of romantic glamour, the sort of dark glamour of his work. Um, we try and look at who are the important designers, and also, of course, uh, looking at designers that we think may be important in the future. And this is true of Daphne as well. In addition to getting things from sort of blue chip, top of the line haute couture, she also works with young designers who she thinks are going to be important. Uh, people like Gareth Pugh, who's still a very small company, but she believes in his vision. So we've also been buying things by Gareth Pugh. We buy things by Rodarte, other young designers who we think are going to be, in, as we look back on it, really important. And when you say important, how do you measure a designer's importance? Is it from the press they get? from their sales, workmanship. How do you gauge importance in a designer? Please explain. When we look at which designers to collect, we're really looking at those who other designers admire and watch. 
and we look at those of their collections which seem to have had the greatest influence on other designers and on the course of fashion history. So it doesn't matter if their sales are negligible because many avant-garde designers in fact are ahead of their time and they don't sell very much and they don't make very much money. But uh, you know, Vivian Westwood, when she did all of her things with bras on top of t-shirts, she wasn't making any money, but a few years later everybody else was copying that. And so we made an effort to get some of those original pieces of hers that caused the trend of underwear as outerwear to happen. What is the disparity or gap between the museum program and popular magazines? There are many different venues and many different media that can share fashion. So of course there's the fashion media and the newspapers, the press. There's also stores. You go in a retail store and that's another way to experience fashion. Increasingly people experience fashion on the internet either by watching videos of fashion shows or by buying clothes from eBay. Uh, the museum I think is just another medium uh, whereby people can be exposed to fashion but it's one that looks at fashion from a somewhat different angle. It's not as overtly commercial, it's not trying to sell you something and it can get you to look beyond that particular season's trends to look at maybe other big themes in fashion. There is a general public perception that the institution of the museum intimidates with its scholarly and academic aura. Is this something that you are keenly aware of? And is it necessarily true that one need possess a certain degree of education in order to appreciate your exhibitions? I think that for museum directors, bringing in relatively unsophisticated public is a big issue. You want to bring in publics who are not necessarily those people who go to museums. What's nice running a fashion museum is that everybody thinks that they know something about fashion. And in fact, members of the public are surprisingly knowledgeable about fashion. And they don't find it threatening. So contemporary art, yes, people think, I don't know what it is, I've never seen that. But contemporary fashion, people are keen to, to talk about that. So I think there's none of the intimidation factor that you have with contemporary art museums. People just love to go to fashion exhibitions. If the public perception of the museum intimidates, how do you assuage this anxiety and win them over? I don't think people are intimidated by fashion exhibitions. I think that they come in quite quite happily. I think what's more of a challenge is getting people to think that it might be more meaningful than just a bunch of pretty or weird frocks. Um, but there again, you try and provide context for them so that um, you give them information as much or as little as they want. You try and pitch the exhibition so that it would appeal to members of the general public as well as people who love fashion as well as designers and connoisseurs so that everyone at no matter what level of knowledge can get something from the show. For example, one can argue that live fashion shows are more popular than fashion museums in terms of the public excitement with the former. A live fashion show is obviously very accessible to people, at least emotionally. But it's very inaccessible to people in as much as these shows are not open to the public. So that most people can't watch them and they don't get close to those clothes unless they go to an expensive store and see them. One difference between a, a live fashion show and a museum exhibition is that clothes in a museum are normally not worn on living bodies. They're worn on a static mannequin. Yes. And some people have a problem with that because they think it, it, fashion is a part of life and when it's in the museum it's slightly removed from that. Yes. But I don't think that's necessarily a problem, it just provides you one other way to look at the clothes. What has been your five most popular exhibitions whereby the audience were considerably broader in range in relation to socioeconomic class education or lack thereof, social backgrounds, etc. Well, when we had our Isabel and Ruben Toledo exhibition, because we had Michelle Obama's inaugural dress and coat, that exhibition attracted 
an extremely high percentage of African American and Latino visitors. So the, and what was very cool about it was they came in to see Michelle Obama's dress and then they stayed to see all the rest of Isabel and Ruben's things and were very enthusiastic about what she was doing. Another exhibition that drew in an unusual public was Gothic Dark Glamour. That brought in lots and lots of young people and subculture people and so that was quite nice and, and most of the visitors were very enthusiastic that we hadn't you know, made fun of them, that we respected goth style, etc. So that was cool. London fashion also brought in a lot of young people because we had punk clothes and all kinds of sort of outrageous clothes. That was very cool. Uh, the corset brought in a lot of people because it was the corset the most controversial garment in the history yes. of fashion yes. and it's about the body and so that attracted a huge number of people and then of course if there's something which has a kind of celebrity factor when we did the Bob Mackey show that brought in a lot of people because they watched television and so they'd seen you know Cher's clothes and Carol Burnett's clothes on television. Returning back to the issue of live fashions is it possible to use live models in an exhibition? You really cannot use live models in an exhibition on clothes which are part of a museum collection. It's completely unacceptable by international museum standards. You can, and the V&A has done this sort of live fashion shows where they borrowed clothes from a designer and then had those parade on models through the galleries of the Victoria and Albert Museum so that people could view them as a kind of mini live fashion show. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that the phenomenon popularity of Alexander McQueen's exhibition will help lure the general public to attend, participate in mass fashion exhibitions at institutions such as yours? The, the extreme popularity of McQueen's show, I think, um, certainly helps um, any museum which is putting on a fashion exhibition because of the publicity that surrounded it. But realistically, there have already been so many blockbuster fashion exhibitions. McQueen is the largest so far, but of course there were huge numbers of people who went to the Armani show or who went to the, the Chanel show, etc. The Saint Laurent show in Paris, enormous numbers of people. How many exhibitions do you typically execute in a year and how long does it take you to plan the average show? We put on two special exhibitions a year, like Daphne, two fashion history exhibitions, that's in a different gallery. Um, so four major ones. Then we also work on a small one with the graduate students at FIT, so that's five. And then we do another dozen student and faculty exhibitions around campus or in the, in the FIT gallery. So of the large exhibitions, special exhibitions we tend to work on for at least two years in advance. Fashion history exhibitions tend to be worked on about a year in advance um, and we'll do two, two fashion history ones a year, each of those last six months. The special exhibition ones last approximately four months. You are very busy then. We're very busy, yes. It's an, it's an insane exhibition schedule. For the future, what kinds of exhibitions are we to expect from your museum? After Daphne ends, the next special exhibition will be Impact, 50 Years of the uh, Council of Fashion Designers of America. So Patricia Mears will be curating that. It was the idea of Diane von Furstenberg to showcase the great American designers who belong to the CFDA, both those who are still living and those like Halston who are deceased. Then in the fall next year, we'll be doing one on uh, Ivy style, on Ivy League style, preppy style. And in fall 2013, we'll be doing a big one on queer style, on the influence of gays and lesbians and fashion for the past hundred years. In addition, in the Fashion History Gallery, the beginning in November and then picking up again with part two in May, we'll be doing a selection of masterpieces from the permanent collection at the museum at FIT in conjunction with the publication of a big book by Taschen about the greatest dresses in our collection.